Welcome. Thank you for taking the time to sit down and chat about incident handling and reporting. Um, my name is Jeff Frazier. I talk to a lot of you out in the field regularly. I'm the General Counsel of Operations here at Monarch. Um, and for the record, I'm recording this webinar in Carly's office. These are not my decorations. Um, but anyways, we're going to get into some, uh, some of those tricky situations today um, that happen on site and how to respond to them. Uh, we're talking about things, whether it's a slip and fall that happens on site, property damage from a fire, a flood, or God forbid, criminal conduct out at our sites. All these things happen, they come up when you own properties, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we handle them, avoid them, and what we do to deal with them. So, it's really important for any of these situations that we complete an incident report um, and get other documentation when someone's injured or there's property damage or anything like that happens. Um, it's important that you guys know you are property managers, are assistant property managers or regionals or assistant regionals and whoever else is watching that, this, that, you guys have a lot on your plate and we know that. Um, you, from filling units to keeping them maintained to leasing and all that. Um, so this is an area, you know, it's a tricky area and us here in legal, our department is here to help you. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you guys have a lot on your plate and you do an incredible job uh, you know, owning these properties that we manage and, and doing everything we can to make, make Monarch the company it is today. So thank you for that. So we're going to get into it here. Um, so when we're talking about an incident, what is that? Um, like we said, the most common thing we see by far is a slip and fall at our sites. Um, I'd say 75% of the claims we see are stemming from somebody falling on our property um, and injuring themselves. And if you've dealt with a lawsuit on one of these claims, you'll realize that they're long, they're time consuming, they're frustrating, they're expensive, and you have to deal with a lot of table pounding obnoxious attorneys on the other side that you may see TV ads for, like Frank the Strong Arm or whatever their nicknames are. I'm sure there's different ones in every state. So um, the law varies by, by state, but generally our obligation is to keep our properties free from any dangerous conditions on site. So what does that mean? Dangerous condition could be, frequently we see it as an unnatural accumulation of snow or ice. You know, our sidewalk freezes over um, overnight. Um, after kind of a freeze thaw cycle and someone gets out in the morning and, and slips on it. Um, that's something we consider to be on notice of and we have a duty to put salt down, remove snow, remove ice, do whatever we can to make it safe for our residents, guests, employees, etc. Um, you know, other things that, that I've seen in other claims that can pose issues is a hole in a parking lot where there's three lights out in the parking lot and bad lighting. Uh, it's really important we get out and check our sites at, at night and have a regular um, program in place so we can get out and, and determine what lights need replacing so uh, we have adequate lighting on sites. That's something we see a lot of. Um, you know, other things like an unattached carpet um, at the top of stairs in a residence unit. If, if a resident has um, made a request for maintenance for something like that that can pose a health and safety hazard if someone trips on it and falls down the stairs, which has happened. Um, we need to get on it ASAP because once we're on notice of the issue, it's our responsibility to, to fix it and to go ahead and make sure that we're not dealing with any claims and it's much easier and cheaper and just better for resident relations to deal with all these things on the front end um, rather than having something bad happen and having to deal with it down the line. So, like we said, the best thing we can do to avoid lawsuits is to, is to avoid incidents from happening in the first place. That's not always going to happen, but um, some ways we can try and avoid incidents are um, every single day, someone on site, whether it's the property manager, assistant manager, maintenance supervisor, etc., needs to walk the entire property 
um, and take notes of any issues, whether there's um, ice on a certain sidewalk, whether there's a divot in an area, whether a stair somewhere is uh, feeling like it's going to break, that means replacement. Make notes of these and, and attend to them. If it's not something we can fix immediately, put a cone there or put caution tape around it. Um, so we're putting people on notice of an issue and, and fixing it as soon as possible. So, so nobody's hurting themselves. Um, anything that can pose a danger that's within our control to fix or remove or that we should be on notice of um, within a reasonable amount of time is something we should be fixing and addressing. Um, you know, one thing, snow and ice is an area we see all the time. We have a lot of property snow removal contractors that are responsible for removing ice and snow from certain areas uh, on the property. We need to make sure that they're doing their job. If they're not coming out and salting a property like their contract says they should be, um, we need to do it or call them out there to get to it. Um, you know, sort of a rough example, but we had a property where it was early in the morning and it was a freeze-thaw cycle. We didn't have a lot of snow in the previous couple days, but a gentleman walked out, um, walking his grandchildren to a bus stop, and slipped and fell, and was partially paralyzed in our parking lot. Um, and we were held to be on the hook for it. Now, the snow removal contractor was responsible for snow removal and, and ice treatment of that parking lot, but they hadn't done it. And at the end of the day, where the property owners, and in many cases, were going to be responsible. Unfortunately, in this case, this was a pretty expensive case uh, to resolve after it was determined we were liable, um, and it, it cost close to a million dollars. Um, so it's something we want to avoid, obviously. Um, also, we're dealing with contractors. You want to use our contractor agreement. I don't have it up here, um, but it is on Dropbox, um, and that contractor agreement is for uh, small contracts like snow removal, like landscape contracts, these sort of contracts. And, and this is a monarch document that benefits us um, more than contractors, and we can just attach the scope of work of that contractor to our agreement, have all the parties sign our agreement, and that will protect us from any claims that their contract doesn't their insurance doesn't cover Monarch or our property for any incidents that occur. That's something we've seen in the past. So use our contractor agreement. Your regionals have been uh, briefed on how to um, use that and set up the contractor agreement. Us in legal, we're always happy to help if you have questions about that, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, also, back on our snow and ice issues, a lot of the properties we have are in areas that receive a lot of snow and ice. Um, it's really important that we fill out our snow log, and this is a template we have available on Dropbox, every single day during the winter months. Um, now, why every single day? The reason for that is um, if something occurs, a lot of these claims pop up, we may not be on notice of them until a year down the road. Now, it happens on March 22nd. If we don't have an entry in our snow log for March 22nd, you know what Frank the strong arm the attorney is going to say? He's going to say that we didn't do anything, we didn't inspect the property, it was dangerous, and so we should pay him a bunch of money. Um, so that's why we need to go ahead and, and during the winter months put an entry in for every single day with the date the time of removal, salting, inspection, the approximate temperature, what was going on with the weather, did we have a new snow or ice conditions since the last time, the last entry, uh, what employees were conducting the snow removal, what specific areas were treated, if we did shoveling or, or ice melt application, and, and how much salt was actually used. Um, I have seen these documents push back and win cases against, frankly, BS claims. Um, but if you don't have the documentation, we're kind of just left not sure what we did that day. Um, because I don't know about you, but I tend to forget things um, 
pretty easily. The other thing about snow and ice um, and slip and fall claims, most of these claims occur early in the morning. Um, that claim I gave you an example of, I think, was around 7 a.m. Um, we see a lot of claims between 5.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. People get out, they're on their way to work first thing in the morning, and it's frozen the night before, they're not paying attention, boom, they hurt themselves. Um, so the earlier we can do snow and ice removal, the better. Obviously, we don't need to be out there at 3 in the morning waking up our residents, shoveling snow, but 6 a.m., 7 a.m. are good times to get out there if we can make that work. Um, I highly recommend doing snow removal as early as, as we possibly can because, like I said, most of these issues happen in the morning. So incident reporting itself. Here we have our incident report. And this incident report can be used for whether it's property damage, whether it's a slip and fall, whether it's a tenant caused fire, whether it's criminal activity going on site. It kind of covers everything. You want to keep it all in one place, make it simple. Not everything will apply depending on what you're dealing with, but um, situations where anybody's injured, um, if they've sought any medical treatment or anything like that, um, that's a time an incident report needs to be filled out as well as if there's you know, property damage to our property, um, I'd say in excess of a few hundred dollars that's um, caused by some sort of incident or pr property damage to a resident's property if there's a flood or a tree branch falls on someone's car, something like that. Just so we can get as much detail as possible because years down the line having that detail really does make a big difference. So. Like I said, no matter all the precautions we take, unfortunately, things are going to happen at our sites. Um, and we have to know how to respond to them when, when this happens. Um, so getting the proper documentation like the incident report in, in a timely manner is crucial. Um, we want these incident reports turned around to legal within 24 hours. Um, it doesn't have to have all the details there. It just puts us on notice and we can then help kind of advise on issues as they progress. Um, we also have to know how to deal with the impacted resident or guest um, and how to communicate with them and express our sympathy for whatever happened um, while not necessarily claiming responsibility for it until we know more about the situation. So for our incident reports, the manager or assistant manager at the property needs to fill this out. This is not for us to hand to the person who says, hey, I fell down, um, well, here's the incident report. They do not fill this out. In fact, they don't get a copy of this. This is our business record that we keep as an internal document um, to know details about what occurred. The property manager or the assistant manager should be filling this out with their property name, address, manager contact information. The date and time of the incident, as close as we can possibly get that, is crucial, as well as the exact location um, and photographs for, say, if someone falls on site of that exact area as soon as possible after the incident are crucial as well. But a description of exactly where, you know, they fell outside of building two at the corner of the parking lot on the northeast end, something to that effect with pictures is, is helpful. Um, you know, we need to know if they're a tenant, visitor, subcontractor, employee, although we have a separate incident report if an employee is injured, um, and we should be using Peloton and Tabitha Sparks when that occurs. Uh, the day the incident was reported, if a vehicle was involved, say somebody, there's a car accident or a parking lot, something like that, information on the vehicles, the insurance information is very important. Um, if there's criminal conduct or something, whether police has been notified or fire, if there's a fire. Um, what we know about medical treatment that's been sought on there, um, always good to know. Any insurance information, rough estimate of potential damages involved and whether photos are taken and by who. The most important thing is the detailed description of this incident on page two here. This is for the property manager or the assistant manager to fill out and really just tell us what happened. Um, give us a story, let us know who all the people involved or responded were, um, give us a little context about what's going on here. And then finally, 
for the person who's injured or affected or has property damage, they should fill out a written witness statement as well as anybody else who witnessed the incident, uh, was involved in it, or our employees who responded to it. We can print a bunch of copies of these, have them write on it, have them print it out, however they want to do it, but they should include their name, any contact information for them so we can follow up with them if we need to. Um, and then that's the incident report. It, uh, you know, you want to attach as much supporting documentation as you can whether that's photos, weather reports, your snow logs, if it's if that applies, um, and you want to get it get it up to us in legal so we can evaluate it and see um, if further actions needed on it, um, or if we need to investigate it further or report it to our insurance carrier or anything like that. So um, I believe that's more or less all of it on incident reporting. So let's talk a little bit about. Uh, communicating with our residents or the persons who are affected. This can get tricky. Um, a, lot, a lot of times you have people who are upset. Um, they might not be the most reasonable in their approach. Um, and I found from doing this at Monarch for about three years that frequent and sympathetic communication with the impacted resident or guest or whoever is the best possible way to avoid a lawsuit. Um, now this doesn't mean we have to say, oh, this is all our fault, let's open up the checkbook to you. But what it does mean is you can call and check up on a resident if you know something happened and, and if they were twisted their ankle or something. Just giving them a call a day or two later and saying, hey, how are you doing? Are you feeling any better? goes a really long way. It shows our residents we care. Um, and it keeps us updated on, on what's going on with, with this situation. Um, you know. We don't want to express fault for it until we know if we're at fault. Um, not every bad incident that happens on site is our fault. A lot of residents feel differently, but um, that's simply not the case. Sometimes bad things happen, um, and I'm the lucky guy who gets to deal with a lot of those. Um, so the number one thing not to do when communicating with somebody who's had an incident is do not ignore them. If they're calling, even if they're unreasonable, people go retain lawyers to sue companies when they feel like they're not being heard. So give them a call. If, if you're confused about how to respond to them, get your regional involved, get legal involved. We have seen a lot of these issues and, and we can either get in touch directly or, or recommend on how to approach it if you're confused about it. Um, like I said, people take at, at further actions when they feel like they're not being heard. So I think I've covered all of it. Um, that's probably more death and destruction than you'd like to deal with today, but these are the things that happen sometimes, unfortunately, when you're managing properties like we do. Um, thank you all for taking the time to watch this webinar and for all you do out in the field. And Keep up the good work.